Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name for all your children that are here tonight. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for their love for your word. We're praying, Lord, that nobody will go back home empty-handed in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding. And we pray, Lord, you help us to be what you want us to be. And you help the whole church to be what the church ought to be in your sight. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome you to the Bible study again today. We're still studying the book of Revelation. You remember the book of Revelation is divided by Jesus Christ himself into three parts. Part one, the things to have seen. That is the vision of the glorified Christ. Part two, the things that are. That is the things related to the church. Concerning the church. Concerning the whole church. And then part three will be the things that will be hereafter. That is the things that will happen after the time of the church. As he spoke to the church, he's speaking through each of those churches and he's speaking to the churches today. Now we come to the first church that we're studying today. Actually, this looks like the church in the middle because you have three on this side, three on this side, and then one in the middle giving us seven churches. And actually, it's a tyrant was the smallest of the towns. And would you see that the longest message was given to this small church because the Lord had a lot to tell them. But please understand that as we look at all these churches, the churches represent all the churches at a particular time and all the churches in every age. Not only that, you'll see the characteristics of Christians in these churches that we're looking at. We're together reading in Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 18. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. Unto the angel of the church in Tatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. The Lord identified himself, and then he said he was writing to the church. Well, you know the desire of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning his church. You ought to know the expectation of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the church. What's his desire? What's his expectation? That the church will be holy. That the church will be pure. That the church will be spotless. In fact, that's the desire that every bridegroom expects of the bride. And since Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride, that's the desire he has that the bride, the church, will be holy and pure and spotless. In fact, the Bible says that he sacrificed and gave his blood to cleanse and sanctify the church and that the church might be a glorious church, not having spot, not having wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Do you understand then that anytime there is blemish in any church, the Lord is not satisfied. Anytime there is spot, anytime there is unrighteousness, uncleanness, the Lord is not satisfied. That's the reason he's talking to this church and he's speaking to this church, he's speaking to you and to me and he's speaking to this church as well. In fulfilling the vision and the desire of the Lord Jesus Christ, the leadership of the early church, they dealt with sin and they stood against the teachers that will bring wrong or sinful influence in the church. You see, the leadership of the early church, they will not tolerate sin and they will not tolerate teachers that will bring impurity, unrighteousness into the church of the living God. See the way they dealt with sin in that early church in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 20. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 20. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. That means then we're not to tolerate sin in the church. We're not to pat sinners, backsliders at the back in the church. We deal with sin and we deal with sinners and backsliders decisively so that the church of the living God will be pure. But as you have seen, the early church was not tolerant of sin. Neither were they tolerant of the teachers of impurity or the teachers that will have wrong influence upon the people. We're told in Romans chapter 7. 16 reading from verse 17 now i beseech you brethren mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them 
You see the early church, they want members of the church. Do you see anyone, any teacher, any preacher, any pastor that is teaching something contrary to the holiness that is required in the church or to the lifestyle, the Christian lifestyle, the Christ likeness, conformity to Christ that the Lord is expecting in the church? You find anyone like that? Deal with that issue. Avoid them. You'll see then the attitude of the early church when people came in, they examined them. And if there was anyone that was having false doctrine, I will bring people back into bondage of sin. They will resist them. They will not even give them an hour of attention. Because the early church, they wanted the members of the church to be steadfast in the truth. Steadfast in the life of righteousness. In second epistle of John, Second John, reading from verse 8. The apostle of love still warned the people of God that they should not accept sin, tolerate sin, cover up sin in the midst of the people of God. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, this doctrine of the new birth, ye must be born again. This doctrine of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If any come to you and will not bring this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. You'll see then why the Lord was talking in such a firm way to the church in Tatira. They had allowed the people that were perpetrating error, the people that were influencing the people of God, in evil ways. They allowed them to just go on unchecked and they allowed them to be perpetrating their error. Whereas, what they should have done is to stop them. The church in Tatira then had many good points, as we'll see as we study today, many good points for recommendation. But the leader and the leadership team were tolerant of evil and they were so permissive that full-scale idolatry and immorality infected many lives without check and without control. The leadership allowed a self-appointed prophetess, calling herself a prophetess by name Jezebel to teach false doctrine and to cause many to backslide without restraint and without discipline. Why did they allow that? Because of the fear of man. And because of the fear of this woman, if you know the life of Jezebel in the Old Testament, and then you know this woman in the New Testament, you know that people were afraid of the Jezebel of the Old Testament. And because of the fear of this woman, even in this New Testament church in Tatira, the, the church kept quiet. The corrupting influence had silenced them. They couldn't open their mouth. And he couldn't challenge the evil that was just flowing freely in their midst. Number two, it had weakened their spiritual muscles. That they couldn't try so. And they couldn't go against the evil sin being done in that church. Number three, it had distorted their per perception of the holiness of God. Number four, they had diverted their attention to pleasing people rather than pleasing God. That's why the Lord was talking to this church. And was warning this church. The title of what we're speaking about today is Warning Against Corruption in the Church. And would you notice that the warning that Jesus gave this church it was a serious warning. And if they didn't repent, he said judgment was coming upon them. We come to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 18 again. And unto the angel of the church in Tatira, write, This thing says the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and I patience, and I works, and the last to be more than the first, none, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest, permittest, you allow that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, and I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works, but unto you I say, 
unto the rest in Tyre, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already. Hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a porter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. In the conclusion, in the final verse of that message to the church in Tatira, the Lord said, this is not only for the church in Tatira. I'm speaking this to all the churches, all the churches in all the ages until I will come. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Here is not a message, is the message of John, it's the message of Christ coming through the Spirit of God and is coming to all the churches. Warning against corruption in the church. There are three points we're going to deal with. Number one, commendation of progress by Jesus. Number two, corruption through the perversion of Jezebel. And then number three, command and promise for the just. Let's come back to number one, commendation of progress by Jesus. It's very interesting the way Jesus Christ addressed all the churches. First of all, before he corrected what was wrong, and before he condemned them for what they had allowed, which they shouldn't have allowed, he commended them, and he told them the things that were good about them. Isn't that a wonderful way of communicating the truth to other people? If you want to witness, if you want to talk to people, you will commend them for the things that are good in their lives before you point out the things that now they need. That has always been the method of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember the young ruler that came to the Lord Jesus Christ saying, what good thing will I do that I'll get to the kingdom of God? And Jesus Christ said, here is what to do. You know the commandments of God. Do this, do this, and do that. And the man said, all these have done from my youth. And Jesus loved him. And he said, that's wonderful. That is very good. Only one point remains. Now do this and then you'll be saved. Even though they had not had the fullness of the experience they ought to have, he commended the good things in their lives. And that's the way we ought to preach the gospel. That's the way we ought to relate with the people we're dealing with. You appreciate them and you praise them for the things that are good. And then that will open them up for the correction that you need to make. Therefore, let us see, number one, the commendation of their progress by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 2, reading verses 18 and 19, and unto the angel of the church in Tatira write, this thing says the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and, and service, and faith, and patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. And that's what Jesus Christ said to this church, the commendation. See the introduction of the Lord Jesus Christ, because in those verses I read to you, there are two things. Number one, the picture of Christ. Number two, the progress of the church. Number one, the picture of Christ. What picture of Christ do we see here? Jesus introduced himself as the Son of God in Romans chapter 1. Reading about Christ, who is the Son of God. It tells us in Romans chapter 1, and it tells us in verses 3 and 4, Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, concerning a son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. You will see that Jesus Christ, as is referred to as the Son of God, it's according to the spirit of holiness. As the Son of God then, he expected holiness in the church in Tatira. But unfortunately, he saw a lot of works, but he did not see the fullness of the holiness he wanted to see. Therefore, he introduced himself. He said, I'm coming to you, and I'm speaking to you, and I'm addressing you, and I'm addressing you as the Son of God. God. And not only that, he introduced himself as the son of God because he wanted to establish his authority that as a son of God, he is the one that has the power to judge them for the evil they were doing or for the evil influence they allowed in that church. In John chapter 5 verse 22, for the father 
judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. That's the reason he introduced himself as the Son of God. In verse 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment also. Because he is the son of man. Therefore, he introduced himself. He said, church, in Tatira, you have not done well. You have not listened to everything that you should have listened to. And you have not been purified. And you have not been made holy. The way you should have been purified and made holy. Therefore, I'm coming to you as a son of God. That will bring judgment. Because all judgment has been committed into my hand. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 verse 31. Because he has appointed a day. In the which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man whom he has ordained. Whereof he has given us assurance. He has given assurance to all men. In that he has raised him from the dead. Over and over you can see in the scriptures. That Jesus. Jesus Christ is the one that judges. In fact, I come back to Revelation chapter 2 and see this picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and see the detail we're given about the Lord Jesus Christ and you will see he's talking about his office, his title as a judge. It says unto the angel of the church in Tatira write, these things says the son of God who has eyes like unto a flame of fire. Nothing escapes his eyes, his sight. His vision. He sees everything. The things that are hidden in secret or the things that are open before men. He sees everything. And then as he introduces himself that I see what you are doing. I see what you allow in the church. I see what you permit in the church because I have piercing penetrating eyes. And sin or evil or blemish cannot be veiled or covered with activities before me. The eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ behold the hidden things of the soul. And then he says he has feet, if you look at that verse 18, and his feet are like fine brass. That is the feet ready to trample down on repentant sinners and backsliders. And that's the description of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you look at that point one, you see the first part of that point one, the picture or the portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now number two, the second part of that place, it's talking about the progress of the church. You come back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 19. I know thy works. What are those works that he knew, that he saw, and he appreciated? Number one, thy charity. Number two, thy service. Number three, thy faith. Actually, the original word here means thy fidelity, thy faithfulness. Number four, thy patience. That's your perseverance. And then he comes back again and says, and thy works. And the last will be more than the first. What was Jesus telling them as he praised them? Four things. Number one, they were loving. Number two, they were laboring. Number three, they were loyal. That means faithful and they, were, uh, they had fidelity. And then number four, they were long-suffering. And this is what he praised them for. He appreciated them for. Uh, look at uh, the other churches too that had this kind of quality among them. In First Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 2 and verse 3. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. As the Lord Jesus Christ praised these people, commended them. So Paul the Apostle, by the Spirit of God, was commending and praising these people as well because of the good things he saw in their midst. And that's what the Lord always does. And he doesn't ever forget the good things in our lives and he will not forget the good things we've done in Jesus' name. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you towards, towards uh, each other abounded, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. You'll see then what the church in Tatira, what they had. There was persecution. 
there was trouble and yet they could endure all through the persecutions and the tribulation they had perseverance or long suffering and if you have that in your life too that's what the lord wants and that's what the lord will command in hebrews chapter 6 reading from verse 10 for god is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that everyone else and to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope on to the end that is the lord wants us after we have started doing good we have been born again you become new creatures in christ and things are all right in your life he wants that thing to continue and that's the uh, thing that uh, actually was good in this church because the lord jesus christ said i know your charity i know your love i know your service i know you are laboring i know your face i know you are you are faithful and i know that you are loyal and i know your patience perseverance i know that you are long suffering in fact i know that your last works are more than the false but uh, there was something here now that was very very serious that the lord uh, wanted to tell them this church was commended for love and faithfulness that grew out of service and patience or perseverance but these are not enough if sin is not dealt with in a scriptural way or scriptural authority love without holiness descends into immorality we must love yes we must serve that's true we must be faithful even with increasing perseverance but the church must not be a hiding place for the corrupting leaven of immorality and that's why we're told in ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse to and walk in love yes we need to love one another walk in love as christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to god for his sweet smelling savor but even though we love one another fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as become a saint saints are to be holy saints are to be saintly let's come to point number two corruption through the perversion of jezebel we're looking at revelation chapter two and we're looking at it from verse 20 notwithstanding i have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrifice unto idols and you see here it looks like the leadership in this church they were not vigilant the leadership in this church they allowed people to come into the workforce without examining them and without checking up whether they ought to be there or they ought not to be there because this woman called herself a prophetess the pastor had not appointed her and she just put herself there and she should have been known because jezebel was not somebody you could hide in a congregation however large you are and her influence going up and down will betray her her style of life style of dressing style of appearance will betray her and they should have known that this woman was there and we never appointed her to be a teacher among the people of god but unfortunately they just saw her and he left her and she was teaching and seducing enticing not only the young converts not only the members even the servants of the lord my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols uh, sometimes you'll find uh, something like that that uh, you have in a local church uh, there is uh, it may be a man it's not only jezebel you know that this it only happened that it happened that in tatira it was a problem with jezebel but you know that it could be a judas iscariot you know that it could be a demas and you know that it could be an ananiah or sapphira it could be a man it could be a woman uh, sometimes you'll find in a church that uh, there is somebody that is parading himself as a leader as a teacher as a counselor as a prayer warrior member and we have not appointed him we have not appointed her and she is there in the district and people are going to her house 
and they are going for vision and they are going for rubbing oil and they're going for whatever it is and she is leading them away from the centrality of the truth of the word of God that the Lord has been teaching us in the church. It may be that a member will, will uh, report to one of our leaders and say, sir, you know what is happening? Uh, there is uh, one woman there. People are going to her. They don't come to house fellowship anymore. Instead of coming to the house fellowship, they go to her house and she'll be rubbing oil on them. And uh, in fact, there's a man there uh, that is also assisting her. And that man will be rubbing their belly with oil and doing whatever. And then you might find that the coordinator or the leader will say, well, leave them alone. Leave them alone. You know, uh, the church is very large. And we can, if we're running after everybody, don't do this, don't do this. We'll break our legs and break our hands and, you know, we'll have a pattern and die before our time. Leave them alone. That's the best they know how to do it. Let's be praying for them. And as you say, let's be praying for them. These people are destroying the church and they're destroying the very basic cardinal pillars of righteous living, of holy living in the church. That's what happened in this church that Jesus said, how could you? A leader in the church. How could you, the angel of the church in Tatira, didn't you see that woman that is calling herself a prophetess and she had not been appointed by you or appointed by the leadership team and yet you leave her just like that? And she's teaching the people, seducing them to commit fornication. And there's no discipline in your church. There's no correction or rebuke in your church. And it's making them to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And in verse 21, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And she repented not. I've given her time. And she has not repented. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. She has been taking them to a bed of sinful pleasure. I'm going to get her into a bed of uh, great pain and punishment and tribulation. And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Except they repent of their deeds and I will kill her children her converts, those who are running to our house. And those who will not come to the church, we have the leaders there, we have the pastor there, we have the coordinators there, we have the group coordinators there, state overseers and, and the national overseers and regional overseers are there. They will not go to them for teaching, for counseling, for correction, but they are going to Jezebel. I'm going to kill them. They have made themselves the children or the converts of this Jezebel. I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your words. It was that serious. Because of the corruption that was in that church. Evil people. They thrive when good people are silent and tolerant of evil. If in your district, if in your local church, you see any evil person there and you are quiet, you might be a good person. When good people are quiet, evil people grow. And they grow in their authority. And they grow in their perpetration of evil. What the church was commended for fades into insignificance before the threatening, corrupting influence of Jezebel. Now, this Jezebel we're talking about, if you know anything about the Old Testament, Jezebel lived about 918 years before the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. And she was the wife of Ahab. And she was a woman of great influence, but that influence was uh, uniformly exerted for evil. And with the cooperation of that weak husband, that is Ahab, Jezebel led the whole nation to idolatry and sorcery and immorality. Can I just uh, show you and remind you of the history of this woman that is called Jezebel? Please turn to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you have the story of Jezebel. And every verse that talks about her, it says something evil about her. You will not want to associate with a woman like this. You will not want a woman like this to be in the district or in the local church or in the, uh, in the region or in the nation because uh, she had terrible, terrible influence that led the people of God into evil. In uh, First uh, Kings chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 31. Just notice what it says about Jezebel as we move on. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Esbel, king of the Sidonians, and went and sat Baal and worshipped him. The very first mention of Jezebel shows us the bad influence 
the idolatrous influence he had on Ahab, the king of Israel. In chapter 18, look at verse 4. It says, and it was so, when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, uh, that's the kind of influence she had, she cut off, she killed, she destroyed the prophets of the Lord. And then in verse 13 of that same chapter 18, was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? She got rid of the prophets of the Lord that will teach the truth, that will emphasize the truth. And if you find anyone that is uh, trying to kill and trying to destroy the influence and the authority of the leadership of the church, the reason they are doing that is that they want to bring the pastor down. They want to bring the leaders down so that nobody will be able to correct them. That's what Jezebel did. She wanted to emphasize and establish idolatry and witchcraft and immorality in the land of Israel. And for her to do that without anybody saying, what are you doing there? Why are you doing that? What she did was to kill and to destroy the prophets of the Lord. A look at chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And with that, how he had slain all the prophets, that is the false prophets of the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me. You see, she, she was not hiding it. She was serving idols, the little, little gods, and the gods of the Zidonians. And he said, So let those gods do to me. And more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. That's how powerful, that's how influential, that's how terrible Jezebel was. And let's look at her more. In Second Kings chapter 9, verse 22, And it came to pass, when Joram saw Jehu, that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he said, What peace? So long as the wardens of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. She even joined witchcraft into it, sorcery into it. And that's why the Lord is telling us that we shouldn't just open our eyes and allow any Jezebel to destroy the work of the Lord. And so you see that this Jezebel really had a terrible influence in that church. This Jezebel in the church in Tatira led real born-again Christians, even some of the Lord's servants to immorality and abominable practices of idolatry. Sin had continued long enough in that church. The Lord had given enough time to repent, but there was no repentance. Time had now come for judgment. Terrible, earthly judgment, eternal judgment. And all who had been led into sin and who refused to repent will be judged severely because our God is a consuming fire. And as the Lord brought the judgment to them eventually, so will the Lord bring judgment upon Upon the people that are doing evil, upon the people that make the people of God to backslide, upon the people that want to corrupt the church of the living God. But you need to watch so that you will not be corrupted and your family will not be corrupted, and your local church will not be corrupted. Because we know that in the last days, perilous times shall come, and there will be people that will depart from the faith. Look at it in the word of God in First Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 1. And verse 2, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. They were in the faith before. There are some that were even born again. There were some that were even appointed as workers and leaders in the church. But eventually, they get into this carelessness. And they get into the lust of the flesh. They have corrupted themselves and they want to corrupt other people too. Because it says, the spirit of the living God is speaking expressly. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. That's backsliding. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devils. They will be speaking lies and hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That is, some people will so backslide. And then they will leave holiness alone. They leave righteousness alone. All they will be doing now will just be to perpetrate evil and to bring corruption into the church of the living God. That's why the Lord is warning us that that time will come and that time has now come that you will watch so that these evil things will not come upon your life. In First John chapter 2, First John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you 
which ye have, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. In verse 26, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. These things am I writing unto you? These things am I speaking unto you? These things am I preaching unto you? Because of the people that are trying to seduce you. Uh, do you remember the language that Jesus Christ used in that Revelation chapter 2? Revelation chapter 2. Uh, look at it once again in verse 21. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. I gave her space to repent. And uh, there are some people, no matter how long you counsel them, no matter how long you preach to them, you ma no matter how much you exhort them, no matter how much you call them privately and say, lady, why are you doing like that? Lady, why are you corrupting the people of God? Lady, what is this story we're hearing about you? Are you not afraid? Don't you know the judgment that came upon Jezebel in the Old Testament? Your lifestyle, your appearance, and your influence, and the things you are doing, and the stories we're hearing, is showing that you are like a Jezebel in the midst of those people of God. You better repent so that the judgment of God will not come upon you. And no matter how soft you are, how nice you are, talking to her, some people will not repent. And Jesus said, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And she repented not. On the other hand, apart from pleading with them, you might even bring some discipline on them. And when they come for prayer, say, no, I can't pray for you. Because you are an evil influence in this church. In fact, we should have sent you out. No matter how strict you are on them, they will just go out and be missing and be walking like Jezebel. And they will still not repent of their evil. There are some ladies like that. There are some men like that. Look at Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9, reading from verse 20. It says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hand. The plagues had come. The judgment had come. And the suffering had come on them. And it says, even though the judgment had come, but they had not died, they repented not of the works of their hand, that they should not worship devils. And the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their mothers. They keep on committing abortion. Even though one of the tubes uh, is damaged and gone already, they still continue in their abortion. And even though they are already having the HIV AIDS, they still continue in their evil sin. And it says of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. They continue in their, even after you have caught them. We caught you that you stole money. Is that true? And you dipped your hand in the, in the offering bag and you took the money. And somebody saw you. You've done evil. And even when you bring them to open shame, they still come to church and they do the same thing. The judgment has come. Discipline has come upon them, but they still continue. And that's what Jesus said. I gave her space to repent. And she repented not of her fornication. And he said, I'm going to do something. I'm not going to just leave her like that. Just because she repented not. I'm going to cast her into a bed of affliction. Into a bed of suffering. And eventually into the bed of hell fire. And I'm going to kill her children. Those who are following her with death. Except they repent. Look at Jeremiah chapter 8. In Jeremiah chapter 8. I'm reading to you from verse 4. Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, Thus says the Lord, Shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away and not return? Why then is this people of Jerusalem sliding back, backsliding, by perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. I hacking and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented of him or him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his cause as the horse rushes into the battle. Look at verse 12. In verse 12 it says, Were they ashamed? Were they had committed abomination? Nay. They were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. The judgment will come. In that time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. I will surely consume them, says the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, no figs on the fig tree. And the leaves shall fade 
And the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. Even the blessings I gave them before, I'm going to withdraw everything from them because of the evil that they are doing. The Lord is warning us that uh, the, the judgment is going to start in the house of God. Look at First Peter chapter 4. In First Peter chapter 4 verse 17, it says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel? Pool of God. And if the righteous castly be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And that's uh, what the Lord was telling the church in Tatira. And that's what the Lord is telling any church that tolerates evil. And that's the warning the Lord is giving to any Jezebel that is hiding in the midst of the people of God and will not repent. Because you need to understand that our God is a consuming fire. In Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading to you from verse 26. And 27, it says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour, consume the adversaries. And then it tells us in verse 31, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let's come to point number three. Now the command and the promise for the just. In Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 24, but unto you I say, unto the rest in Tatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. There were still some faithful members, believers in that church in Tatira. They had not yielded to the pressure of Jezebel and her agents. They had not accepted the doctrine and the powerful influence of Jezebel. And Jesus was saying, yes, I know you too. Because as the word was coming out and the words were fiery, the indignation and the wrath of God was pouring out in the words of Jesus Christ, everybody became afraid. And then Jesus, now, after dealing with the people that had the corrupting influence in the church in Tatira, Jesus now comes back to the faithful ones. He says, yes, I know you. I know you are there. I know you are still holding on. And I know you are righteous and holy. And you will not soil your garments with the immorality of the people of Jezebel. Unto you, therefore, I'm speaking now. Unto the rest of you that have not accepted the deeds and the doctrine and the influence of Jezebel. And you have not accepted to know. You refuse to know the deaths of Satan. Because, you know, some of these people, they were glorying in the fact that, well, you don't know anything. We know the depths of Satan. We know the mysteries of Satan. We know the satanic delusions and the devices. We know the diabolical mysteries, the dangerous, deadly, devilish mysteries of Satan. Even the things that are hidden, we know everything. That's what we are bragging about. But there are these believers that were faithful. I don't want to read those books. They, they come to them with books and cassettes and CD or video, and they say, you see, the revelation in this uh, cassette, in this CD, is terrible. And he's talking about mammoth spirit. He's talking about the depths of Satan. He's talking about the magic. He's talking about occultism. If you know this, you'll be strong in your Christian life. I say, no, I don't want to know. I don't want to see that. That's what Jesus is talking about, that these faithful people, they refuse to know the depths of Satan. The Lord was telling them, keep on standing and keep on being faithful. And he commanded them they should remain free and separated from Jezebel's influence and remain firm, steadfast, and loyal to Christ unto the very end. Then he tells them in verse 25, that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Don't let their pressure take anything away from you. Hold fast until I come. Do you see what Jesus said here? I will lay no other burden upon you. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. I'm reading to you from verse 28 and verse 29. It seemed good unto the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Jesus was telling those people that were still faithful, he said, I'm not going to lay any other burden on you except these necessary things. What are the necessary things over here in verse 29? That he abstained from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fear ye well. He said, as you are going, fear well. 
But hold on to the word of God. That's what Jesus was saying. I'm not going to lay any other burden on you. You have refused to know the depths of Satan. Just keep faithful like that. You have refused to read their trust. Just keep faithful like that. You have refused to listen to their cases and uh, watch their videos. Just keep on like that. And that which you have already, hold fast until I come. Don't get tired. Just keep on holding fast. Because he tells us in Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 35, cast not away. Therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back. I said, we are not of them that draw back. We are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Yes, we know people are going to backslide, but we are not going to backslide with them. We're going to hold fast until the Lord comes. That's what Jesus said. Hold fast, hold fast until I come, that nobody will take your crown. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Prove all things. Check up in the word of God. We we'll speak about holiness. Prove all things. Check it up. We we'll talk about being born again. Check it up. Prove all things. We we'll talk about one man, one wife. Check it up. You can read the Bible. Prove all things. And we we'll talk about the fact that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And many are going to backslide. But the Lord wants you to hold on. Prove all things. Check it up yourself. And then when you have proved it, you have seen it. You see, this is the word of God that cannot be contradicted. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You will turn away from everything that is evil. You know the truth already. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, that good sin which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. The good sin you have, the teaching you have, the transformation of life you have, the newness of life that you have, keep it. Hold on to it. That good sin which has been committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. It tells us in Second Peter chapter 3. In Second Peter chapter 3 verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? The Lord is saying is coming again. You are looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, verse 14, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found in him, in, of him in peace, without sport, without blame, blameless. Then in verse 17, ye therefore beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away, or the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Because we need to hold on. If you don't hold on, you will not remain in Christ. You will not be a habitation of the Lord. And you will not be able to see him when he comes. You need that holding on, keeping that thing until the very end. In Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. That's the condition. You are made a part of Christ, a partaker of Christ. And when Christ comes, you'll be one of the people that will go with the Lord. If you hold fast the beginning of that confidence you have until the very end. While Jesus was going away, before he went away, he was talking to his own disciples. And he wanted them to know that if he was to come back and was to meet them and also take them to heaven, there's something they had to do. They had to hold on to the truth of the word of God. Maybe anybody, some, some of them might be thinking, but... We love you and we're going to hold on till the very end. They might be wondering, would it ever come that somebody will depart from the Lord? 
the way you are, the way you love us, and what you've done for us. Can we ever drop in our love for you? Jesus said, yes, 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 it's going to happen. Many people, in fact, will backslide and go away. But then, if you don't hold on to the end, and you follow the backsliders, you're going to perish with the backsliders. But he was counseling them. He was commanding them that they will continue to the very end. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The people that were running before, they will now slow down and they will be walking. Then they will stand still. Then they will look back. Then they will go back. The people that were on fire before and they loved the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. They will read the Bible. They study the Bible. They will do restitution. They will apologize if they are wrong. And are very sensitive to the things of the Lord and to the voice of the Spirit. A time will come in their lives because of many false prophets. And because of these things flying all about. A fellowship there. An assembly there. This one is going on there. That one is going on there. It says because of that iniquity abounding. That you don't even know where to put your feet anymore. And although churches are multiplying, iniquity is increasing. See the dressing of the people. See the language of the people. Because iniquity is abounding, the love of many shall wax cold. Then Jesus said in verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Will you endure? I said, will you endure? It tells us in Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading to you from verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. It says, behold, I come quickly. If you can tune your ears to heaven, you'll hear that the trumpet's about sounding. If you can look up, you'll see that Christ is about to come. And it says, behold, I'm coming. And I'm coming suddenly and quickly unannounced. Hold that fast, which thou hast. The devil will try to take it away from you. Hold it fast. False prophets, they'll try to take it away from you. Hold it fast. There may be a Jezebel in your community, a Jezebel in your local church that is just hanging there and, you know, going from place to place and giving her body and saying, are you afraid to commit sin? Are you afraid to enjoy yourself? I offer myself to you. Why don't you do it? After all, God is a God of mercy. Or you are bothered by those things that that man is preaching holiness, holiness every time. And God is not as difficult as that. They'll come to you. Hold that fast which you have, that no man take thy crown. I pray nobody will take your crown and you'll hold fast until the Lord will come. Here is what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2 reading from verse 25. But that which thou hast, if you have anything already, hold that fast. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the, the morning star. The morning star, that's himself. He says, I give myself unto you. He that has an ear, let him hear. Do you have ears to hear? Have you heard anything today? Keep that thing that you have heard. He that has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit saith unto the churches. Rise up and let us pray. The Lord is telling us, is calling us to commitment, righteousness, and holiness. Don't allow any Jezebel there. Don't allow any Judas Iscariot. Don't allow any demons. Don't allow any deceiver, any false prophet, any backslider to, to deceive you and to make you backslide. And don't allow your flesh. Don't allow education. Don't allow money. Don't allow material things. Don't allow anything and anybody to turn you back. That which you have, hold it fast. The Lord is about to come. Hold what you have. Hold it fast. Or maybe you don't have anything yet. You don't have salvation. When are you going to be saved? When are you going to be born again? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Since you have been coming, have you been born again? Have you been born again? And if you are born again, there will be a new life. Because if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Do you have that newness of life in Christ? Do you have it? If you don't have it, when are you going to have it? Because the Lord is about to come. And if you are saved, that salvation that you have, hold that salvation fast. Don't let them take it from you. There's a Jezebel around the corner. There's a demons around the corner. There's a false prophet around the corner. They'll try to take the salvation, your assurance away from you. Hold it fast until it comes. 
Do you have sanctification? This is the will of God for you for your sanctification. Do you have holiness? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. If you have that holiness, there are some people, they'll try to take that holiness away from you. Hold it fast. That which you have, hold it fast until I come. Do you have sound doctrine? The doctrines of the Bible. Sound doctrine, the word of God. There are people that will come to try to tell you, oh, doctrine doesn't matter anymore. Bible study doesn't matter anymore. Standing straight and standing firm, honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints, all that doesn't matter anymore. What you have, hold it fast. Honestly contending for the faith. Honestly contending for the faith. Once delivered unto the saints, put your body under. Let's after you have preached and witnessed to other people, yourself will be a castaway. That which you have, hold it fast until I come. Don't allow the Jezebels of the day, church Jezebels, religious Jezebels, don't allow them to take away what you have in your hand, what you have in your heart. Hold it fast until it comes. The Lord is coming. When the Lord comes, where will you be? Make sure he finds you in the righteousness and holiness that is looking for, without which no man shall see the Lord. Hold fast until he comes.